Adam. It's Friday, Neil. We're together. That's right. We are together. I like it when we're together. I totally enjoyed being with Dylan last week. I think he did great. I thought he did great, too. Is that your way of telling me that you'd rather be with Dylan right now? I feel like that was kind of a... Well, Dylan is actually here. That's true. And he's he's directing this whole thing. Right. We couldn't do it without him. That's right. (laughs) So tell me, we're excited to hear about the sermon this week. Um, We are handling uh, and discussing Hebrews chapter 6. Everybody in our congregation probably has been waiting on pins and needles uh, to get to this. Right. And... uh, I have been trying to avoid this for like 29 years. <laughs> right. You almost made it. I did. Almost you know, 30 years Almost 30 that. years ago. Uh, yeah, you and I love to talk about serious things in a humorous tone. Yeah, right. Uh, yeah, this is, uh, this is different. This is a serious thing this in a very is, serious tone. Yeah, I mean, uh, G. Campbell Morgan in his commentary and sermons on Hebrews chose to leave out right. Hebrews chapter 6, 4 through 8, right. 12, somewhere around there. So if the prince of preachers, so to speak, mm. uh, knows when to walk away, right. what, the, what are, are we you, doing why here? Why are you trying to do I know. <laughs> <laughs> Why are we trying to teach this passage? For it is impossible in the case of those who were once enlightened and have tasted the heavenly gift and have shared in the Holy Spirit and have tasted the goodness of the word of God and the powers of the age to come and then have fallen away to restore them again to repentance since they crucify once again the Son of God. And there's that phrase, heart. falling away. Yeah. And they're that's treating, what we're worried about, right? This whole thing is about Jesus. Um, What are we doing in our lives that magnify the name of Christ? Mm -hmm. Or are we treating God's grace with contempt? Right. That is at the heart of this. Right. And um, I know that uh, there are going to be those who have uh, read their favorite sermons and commentators. Sure. And they have taken this position or that position. Uh, The truth is, no matter what position you take, these words are just difficult. Right, and that term falling away, like you said, it just impacts people differently. And for something to fall away means it had to have been kept. And so the real question behind that passage, and hopefully something that that is brought out in in faithful biblical preaching, which I'm sure it will be, is if something's kept, then someone has to be keeping it, or something has to be keeping it. Um, And and just another question of, so the Holy Spirit has entered my life through salvation. I've been transformed. I have a new heart, which leads to a new life. That Holy Spirit can just up and leave. Holy Spirit can just go if I don't do well enough. I tell you, to put that burden on an individual that I am so much in control of my salvation that I chose to become a Christian all by my own free will, Holy Spirit, come. I'm inviting you in. I'm in charge. Yeah. And then when some uh, new philosophy comes along or a new theology or a new religion uh, or no religion comes in, I can say, bye. Right. You know, I'm done. Thanks for the help, Christianity. I, yeah. You know, we, we blame Christ for everything at that point. Right. One of the interesting things about that, if you read people who actually believe that you can be genuinely converted with a life change and then somehow separate yourself sure. from God's grace, um, ask them how many times you can do that. Right. Are you you're referring to like rededication sort of in the church? I'm actually going a little bit further than sure. that. Rededication is something like I did right. uh, when I was a teenager. Many times. Many times. <laughs> uh, you're I a very had, rededicated person. I, I had an elderly uh, lady to come up uh, after me. Uh, going up and rededicating my life. And in those days, people would come by, shake your hand, sure. make an encouraging comment. And she said, Neil, you don't have to come up every Sunday. <laughs> you, you've done this enough, son. I, you, know, I, you know what the interesting thing about that is? Mm. I believe that God's grace was on me from early on. Yeah. Um, at 17, he called me into the ministry. Um, during my college years, I was studying sacred music, minoring in religion, I got called to go into evangelism while I was traveling. That's when I met my dear wife, Pam. Mm -hmm. Um, 
And then I go to seminary, and of all things, I meet Jesus at the cross. Yeah, people don't know that. You got saved um, while in seminary. I, part of what goes on when I read this scripture about being enlightened and tasting the heavenly gift, there were very few things within Christianity that I did not experience right. before I experienced true conversion while I was at seminary. Right. And so this rings true to me. Um, I, was or, I was ordained, led people to Christ, sang in front of hundreds, preached to hundreds, mm. and then I came to the cross. Do you know nothing changed me more than coming to the cross? Mm. And um, there's nothing in my life that I would want to sh somehow demonstrate or ex express contempt mm. for his grace. Right, exactly. And so this is a, a little personal. Yeah, seems me. that way. Yeah, I think that's going to be, uh, I think it's going to translate really well on Sunday. I think people are going to be able to sense that this is not something uh, you want to promote with some, with an ounce of self-righteousness. If anything, understanding that it is God who holds us fast and not our own works is sort of the opposite of self-righteousness. It's, it's saying uh, we don't have control over this, no. Lord. You have the control over it. We have to but submit to your will. And preachers, still with good intentions, preach that, accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. You, they, you scream they that do. from the pulpit. Yeah. I would say, let's include us because we've grown Absolutely. in our faith as Absolutely. well. I hope. That we have sincerity from the pulpit, but sometimes we sound like an itinerant prophet right. preaching to people that we don't know when these are our flock. These, these, are, these are hopefully our friends and faith family and people who've entrusted us and hold us accountable for what we preach. That's right. And that's the reason when we preach hard stuff, right. they need to see that we love them. I also think this draws um, some importance uh, when it comes to, uh, or kind of points to the importance of preaching a sermon series through a book and developing a context. I couldn't imagine just choosing to preach this passage completely out of nowhere without really having ramped up to it uh, for the, through the first five, six chapters of Hebrews. So I'm really glad that, they, that we've been doing that yeah, first, taking, laying groundwork. Yeah, it's taken <laughs> five previous chapters to finally say, yeah, it's impossible right. and he, and he's to come saying, back yeah. if this happens. And he's saying this at a time, exactly, he's saying this at a time too, where he's kind of, he can see it in their eyes that they no longer are excited or interested in what he's saying. And so he's stopping before he talks about Melchizedek in chapter 7 as the priest king, which is what I mentioned last week. He's, he's saying, you know, you're, you're no longer interested, and here's why you should be. And, and the context, like you said, um, of the author of Hebrews having a pastor's heart and why that's so necessary no, that, when it comes to falling away. You know, we've heard politicians say, I feel your pain. Right. Pastors should feel the pain, the stress, the anxiety, mm -hmm. the weight of temptation that their church family is going through. Yeah. And that is what this man is sensing. Mm -hmm. And so he's pleading and he's even using a, a warning of possible eternal damnation right. to keep them from making that terrible decision to go back to their old sacrificial system right. within Judaism and abandon the one true sacrifice that can atone for our sins. And, and there it is, abandon. That's right. And what that looks like from the outside versus what we could actually do if we've been truly saved by Jesus Christ. Right. I mean, that is really the juxtaposition, isn't it? It is. Um, the, the more I meditate upon the cross. Mm -hmm. The more difficult it is to look at him in the face, so to speak. Right. I don't know what it means to be a tax collector. <laughs> that was not your route. Fact, no, it wasn't my route. <laughs> and uh, and you know, bless those who are. Sure. Um, but man, he when he prayed at the temple, right. he was afar off. He couldn't look up. 
He just pleaded for mercy. And that is so important that that sense and that that tone be presented uh, in a passage like this. Because if anything, we're hoping people realizing they need to relent and to submit more and to understand who really is in control of holding fast their faith will present uh, create rather a gratitude, a thankfulness. Like no. We want thankful, uh, grateful hearts, not people thinking that every bit they do, every single work they put towards their faith is something that's helping it stay in place. Preachers have done such a disfavor to their congregations by just imposing you've got to do this, you need to be more holy. Behavioral modification. Yeah, behavioral modification, um, how-tos, the how-tos of Christian life have weighed down on people more than any one thing and has caused uh, either pride because they succeeded right. or desperate uh, hopelessness right. because they don't succeed Which is, in it. feels like abuse, really. Well, yeah. well, it is. Whereas we preach Christ mm -hmm. and Him crucified and the implications of His keeping power and holding us fast, that is encouraging. And I'm grateful for that. And I know that you're going to be drawing some... Uh, systematic theology from this as you preach. And, and, and this reminded me of, I uh, read the book of Jude this morning, which is not a difficult morning task. You can kind of read that every day. It's That's not that long. <laughs> uh, but 24 through 25 further emphasizes exactly what we're talking about. We hope is at the center of yeah. the sermon itself, which is the goodness and faithfulness of our Savior. And then in the coming weeks leading up to Holy Week, talking about exactly what it means to have a Messiah. But the passage says this, to him who is able to keep you from falling, and to present you before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy to the only God, our Savior, be glory and majesty. Uh, that imputation of righteousness that takes place because of the cross and the atonement uh, to, given to us there of, of our sins. I mean, this is really so gospel-centered. And the activation of the Holy Spirit in our lives to keep us, the perseverance of the saints, is the human experience of God's preserving the saints. Exactly. And, and how this highlights struggle. And that as we have our flesh, which we won't be rid of until the day we die uh, and are given a new soul, new body, we have the Holy Spirit living within us, those who are saved, those who are part of the body of believers. Uh, and that flesh and spirit are going to struggle. And it's just a very honest approach. Well, from now until Sunday, if you don't mind, uh, you know, keeping me in your prayers, yeah. because I have rewritten this mm -hmm. over and over and over again. And, um, uh, I just want it to be clear, yeah. convicting, right. and encouraging. I'm excited for it, Pastor, and I, I guarantee um, that will happen because I've seen it so many times before in your preaching. Well, but uh, I love you, man. Thank you. I and, love you. And I'm praying for you. God bless.